All right, we are going to study God's Word now. Uh, we're in the book of 1 Samuel. We're studying the life of David. That means 1 and 2 Samuel primarily. Our text this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verses 14 through 44. The topic we're going to find there is this. On his way to slaughter Nabal and the men of his household, David encounters Abigail blocking the road. The title of our message, Abbey Road. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. We want to dig into it right now. Uh, We want to see Jesus revealed in it. I think it's going to be pretty easy this morning uh, to see him. We want to be like him as well, Lord, and that's going to require the work of your Holy Spirit making uh, significant adjustments in our heart. But Lord, all of us that know you, that have called upon your name and have received the forgiveness of sins, we want to be like you more than sometimes we know. We get distracted, things of the world, our flesh, the devil, all these kinds of things, Lord, they come against us. But you give us an opportunity on days like this, on a Sunday, Lord, when the Lord's people are gathered together to to just focus on who we want to be in Christ. And so I pray that you do some things in our heart, Lord, that need to be done, that we would be thrilled uh, at what you are going to talk to us about this morning. Uh, Thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Have you ever asked God to make you a servant? Well, I'm sure you have if you're a Christian. But just what kind of a servant did you have in mind? You see, the word servant or servants or serve or service, they occur well over a thousand times in the Bible. They describe everything from free, voluntary service that is more like employment to involuntary slavery and, of course, everything in between. The two most common New Testament words for servant are doulos and diakonos. Doulos is translated variously into English as bond servant, bond slave, slave, and servant. A lot of times uh, people will say, I've said it, you know, this is the word doulos, which means bond slave. Well, it sometimes does, but sometimes it just means servant. Those are all very different positions. The bond servant, the bond slave, the slave, and the servant. Even a steward is sometimes called a doulos. They all have different degrees of freedom. And so there's obviously a big difference there it depends on what you mean exactly. Diakonos is used of someone who executes the commands of another person. It was used, for example, to describe the servant of a king. It was used of a waiter who served food and drink. So this afternoon when you're in Chile, you say, Diakonos, Diakonos. You won't get any better service, but uh, probably won't be any worse. But anyway... Uh, Uh, It was used of a waiter, and that's probably why the seven guys in the book of Acts picked to distribute food to the widows were called diakonos, from which we get our word deacon. It derives actually from an obsolete obsolete verb uh, that means to run errands. Again, we see that there can be a variety of meanings to this one word. And so when you ask God, make me a servant, Are you saying that if you happen to be going a certain way anyway, you'll be happy to run an errand for him? Or do you mean that you are his slave ready to do anything and everything you are told? The truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, when I'm honest with myself, I fall in a range there. There are some things where I think, well, yeah, I am the absolute slave of the Lord in this area. But then there are times I feel more like an employee in terms of my cooperation and what I want to do. And times when I want to say to the Lord, well, Lord, I know you want me to do that. I'm not going that way right now, perhaps a little bit later. Well, there's a godly woman in our chapter. Her name is Abigail. She gives us her understanding of what it meant to be the Lord's servant. In verse 41, if you'll look there, please, she describes herself by saying, here is your maid servant, and here's the definition she put on it, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Being a servant of servants, willing to wash the feet of other servants, was what Abigail thought serving was, and it puts her in good company. Because it's exactly what Jesus demonstrated on the night before he was crucified when he took the place of the servant of servants by stooping to wash his disciples' feet. In Abigail, 
we're going to be able to identify at least two things that compelled her to have the servant heart of Jesus centuries before he stooped to wash the feet of the disciples. Those same two things can compel us if we are to be servants in this true biblical sense. And so I'll organize my thoughts around two points. Number one, the Lord's compassion compels you to be a servant of servants. And number two, the Lord's coming compels you to be a servant of servants. First of all, in verses 14 through 19, let's take a look at compassion. Now we're in the middle of a story. It's summed up pretty well as one of the young men in Abigail's household told her what was about to happen. We pick up our story in verse 14. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men who were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household. He is such a scoundrel that no one can even speak to him. If you were here last week, or if you're familiar with this area of Scripture, you remember the story. David's fugitive army of 600 men had been protecting from Philistine raiders the shepherds and sheep of a wealthy farmer named Nabal. It was shearing time now, harvest time, and David sent some of his men to collect food and supplies from Nabal as the agreed-upon payment for their protection. Nabal refused to pay a dime, insulting David in the process. David flew into an uncharacteristic rage and was on his way with 400 of his men armed to kill Nabal and every male member of his household just for good measure. If you ask me, Nabal was getting what he deserved. It was unfortunate that others in his household were going to be killed along with him, but that's the way things were in those days. Uh, I'm not excusing it, but you rose and fell with your master. And so Nabal, uh, on one level, obviously we don't want to see him killed, but on one level you think, yeah, he's a fool, he deserves that. Uh, and it was going to be a bloodbath. Instead of letting things play out, Abigail intervened. Taking matters into her own hands, Abigail put together a reasonable payment for David and his men. And so in verse 18, Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five sayas of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. I think we see something of Abigail's motive now in verse 19. It says, she said to her servants, go on before me. I am coming after you. She did not tell her husband Nabal. As big a fool as he was, Nabal did not deserve to be killed for this infraction. Of course, neither did the males in his household. To stop the slaughter, however, Abigail would need to put herself at risk at great personal cost. She would have to block the road by her physical presence, one woman and her donkey against 401 armed men, and it would cost her everything that she could put together in terms of her storehouses. What was her motive? Well, I'm sure there were many, but I see compassion moving her to do something to help her husband and his men, even though they were undeserving. One biblical reason I have to call it compassion is because we've already seen that Abigail thought so much like Jesus long before the Lord came to earth. She said she was a servant who would wash the feet of other servants and it immediately you think of Jesus Christ who on the night before his crucifixion washed the feet of his own servants. And so Abigail's thinking like the Lord and when it comes to making a roadblock from destruction... This is what Jesus Christ did for us. In his sermon on Christ's compassion, Charles Spurgeon writes, and I quote, Compassion may be taken as a clue to the Savior's whole life. If you would sum up the whole character of Jesus Christ in reference to the human race, it might be gathered into this one sentence, He was moved with compassion. Whether it was in eternity past, or when Jesus walked the earth, or even now that He is seated in heaven, Christ's actions on behalf of the human race were motivated by compassion. 
He saw our need and he decided to come. He was moved to do something about it. There's a sense in which we were all Nabal's. Now, we saw last week that Nabal's name translates to fool. That's what the word means. And a fool in the Bible isn't somebody who's ignorant. Uh, The Psalms tell us the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Literally, the fool has said in his heart, no God. He said no to God. He's living his own life. Uh, And so Nabal is a perfect example of a human being, uh, of the typical human being, as it were, of the human being that people want to be apart from God. He was very wealthy. It was shearing time and he was having a a party, partying along. Uh, He had a trophy wife, Abigail, who loved him and and was submitted to him, willing to lay down her life for him. Uh, he He had everything that the world had to offer. But little did he know, coming down the road at pretty good pace was an army set on destroying him and everything that he had built. And it's just like the man of the world, the woman of the world, whose life is a vapor. It appears for a moment and then it vanishes away. We don't know how much time we have. What good does it do to gain the whole world only to lose your soul? And so before you're a Christian, if, and those of you who came to Christ later in life, you attest to this. Before you're a Christian, you're living your life. You've got a focus and a direction. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's something. And you think, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm either there or I'm getting there and I'm building bigger barns and I'm enjoying life. All the while, destruction is moving towards you, marching inevitably towards you. You don't know if it's going to be a heart attack or a car accident, old age. You don't know what it's going to be, but it's coming. And you're in deep, serious spiritual trouble because if you die in your trespasses and sins, you die forever separated from God. And so Nabal is a good example to us. And what Christ did is he had compassion on the Nabal race that we are, and he came and he did something about it. And Abigail said, I have to do something about this. My husband might deserve this. He might not. The men in his household certainly don't. Whatever, I am moved to do something about this. While we were yet sinners and even rebels, Jesus determined to put himself at risk at enormous personal cost. To be that servant of servants washing the feet of his disciples, Jesus laid aside the rights to his deity He came to earth as a man, and as the God-man, he humbled himself as God's servant unto death, even the death of the cross. And so the question for me today is, do I have the compassion of the Christ? Can I serve someone like Nabal for the sake of Jesus Christ? Can I do it as unto the Lord? Well, if I, uh, I can, if I am a believer, because by definition, I have the nature of Jesus Christ within me. But I need to settle in my heart that this is the kind of servant I am. I'm not just a voluntary servant. I'm not a person who might occasionally wait tables as an employee or run an errand if and when it's convenient. No, I I have to settle that in my heart I'm a servant to servants. I'm a foot washer. I'm waiting always to be assigned a task by the Lord that I will not refuse. The feet I wash won't always be those of grateful, deserving individuals i mean take abigail in our story as far as she knew she was going to spare her husband's life everybody would be saved for a time but as far as she knew he would go on being an absolute fool a scoundrel it would not help her at all in fact chances are nabal would be angry with her he might discipline her he might beat her because she had paid david off when he thought he had Uh, you know, outwitted him. We don't know. She put herself at great risk to wash his feet, as it were. But that's not why she did it. She did it because that's what Jesus would do. And that's why we ought to do it. That's what Jesus would do. He's not here, and I am. And so we're the ones who take that place now. Now, Abigail positioned herself in the road. She became a human roadblock, and we see the result of it Uh, in the remaining verses where we'll say that the Lord's coming is what compels you to be a servant of servants. On a practical level, Abigail is going to appeal to David to relent from slaughtering Nabal and his household because it would be unbecoming of the character of Israel's future king. On a spiritual level, she acts as a servant of the king whose coming has been promised and is certain but has been delayed. 
When we see it that way, we can see ourselves as those who also intercede for those who will otherwise be destroyed at the coming of our king. Jesus is the king who is certainly coming. And while we don't want to press the typology too far, because unlike David, the Lord is not coming in anger with wrong motives, but he is definitely coming, and when he gets here, he's going to judge the living and the dead. And so his coming ought to compel us to serve others so that they will be ready for him when he comes. And so in verse 20, So it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went down under the cover of the hill, and there was David and his men uh, coming down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him. He has repaid me evil for good. May God do so, and more also, to the enemies of David, if I leave even one male of all who belong to him by morning light. 401 armed, angry men were coming bent on bloodshed. One unarmed woman blocked their approach. If you don't think this is a terrifying scene, if you don't think that Abigail is putting herself at risk, I don't think you understand at all uh, the Middle Eastern mindset and, and what was going on at this time. But in verse 23, now Abigail saw David. She dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. And so the first thing David sees, her immediate response to seeing him is that she takes a position of submission to him as her future king. This speaks to us of our understanding of the kind of servant we are. Again, are we volunteers? Are we co-workers? Or are we immediately submitted to the will and the ways of Jesus Christ? Verse 24. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. Please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Abigail, who is presented earlier in this chapter as a godly woman, and who we see acting godly throughout, says... I'll take Nabal's sin on myself. Deal with me the way you would deal with Nabal. That's pretty intense. And we look at that, and I think on a human level, we think, well, you know, she can't really identify with Nabal because, you know, David knows she's not a fool and all this stuff. And sometimes we even have a hard time. We read these prayers in the Bible, you know, Daniel and others who take the sin of their people upon themselves. But what's happening spiritually is Abigail is, is uh, typifying again for us, this is exactly what Jesus Christ actually did. Jesus came and he said, Father, I do take their sin upon myself. I'll take it. And God put the sin of the world upon Jesus Christ. He died for us. He took that penalty and he made that payment. And then he says, now if you believe this, I can give you my righteousness and the forgiveness of sins. And so Abigail takes the place of Christ. In his case, he who knew no sin took our sin upon himself on the cross. And as I said, he paid its penalty and suffered its punishment. The servant we want to be identifies with others. Not in the sense that we can take their sin upon ourselves, but we can tell them about the one who has Because we look at them and we think, but for the grace of God, there go I. If you're dealing especially with a non-believer, I don't care how difficult it might be. Yes, they're making your life miserable. They really are. They're ripping you off. They're standing in the way. They're foolish, whatever it might be. You hate working with them. Still, you can step back and think, there go I, but for the grace of God. That was me. And so what do I want to do to that person? I want to share Christ with them so that he can transform them from within. Verse 25, Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now this may seem disrespectful for a wife, uh, you know, some people suggest that this all this pent-up frustration, you know, she needs psychotherapy. She gets her chance to say, yeah, my husband's a scoundrel and a fool, and it makes her feel better. But all she's really doing is telling the truth. And again, in the broader context, 
If I'm talking to a person who's like Nabal, at some point I have to say, you're a fool in the sense that you're saying no to God and that's going to be bad in the long run. You're going to have to tell people that they're sinners at some point. Now, when a person understands what you're saying, they don't like that. You're telling them that they, at the very deepest part of who they are, they are deceived and wicked and evil. There's nothing good in them. They can't get to heaven on their own. There's no good work. And so I don't think until a, you know, either a person absolutely receives that and gets saved or they think about it and they, they're going to get mad. They're going to be a little bit upset perchance if they really understand what you're saying. You know, when you share Christ with you, you don't say, you know, we have a lot of fun on Sunday mornings. We have a coffee shop. We serve biscuits and gravy. Uh, you can mow your lawn another day, but come and have church with us. It's just a lot of fun. It, you, it, you might enjoy it. No, at some point you say, you know, you need to quit mowing your lawn on Sunday. Get to church so maybe you'll get saved because I don't want to see you die of a heart attack one Sunday while you're mowing your lawn and end up in hell. And people, I mean, that's not going to go over too well. You know, people, once they understand what you're really talking about, and so that's all she's doing. She's not dissing her husband. She's just saying, hey, my husband is lost. You are lost and you need Christ. In verses 26 through 30, Abigail appeals to David's relationship to the Lord in order to call him back to his walk with the Lord. Verse 26, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Abigail reminded David that God had a plan for his life. He too was a servant fighting the Lord's battles. The Lord had strengthened him thus far to do what was right and godly. She mentions the sling. God had strengthened him to kill Goliath. It's still David's greatest physical victory. And so, you know, who was Nabal compared to Goliath? What, what kind of song would be sung about that? Remember when David killed Goliath, the women went around singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. Uh, what do you say? David killed a defenseless farmer and all of his household for no reason. That's, not, that's a country song. You know, I mean, that's a bad country song. You know, my, you don't want to be associated with that. And then he, she mentions Saul, but she calls him a man. And she points out to David, hey, Saul's against you, but you haven't raised your hand up against them. You're clean of that blood. So why shed innocent blood now? And she treats him as if he's really the king. He's the future king. But she says, look, you don't want to look back on this and have grief. That you went out of character for a time because of your anger. Just put this into perspective. God has a plan for your life. You're his servant. He strengthened you and he'll go on strengthening you if you'll yield to the spirit rather than to the flesh. The kingdom is coming. And at the resurrection and rapture of the church, you will be rewarded and established as a co-regent in it. Now back to the story. You're David. Are you really going to listen to the pleadings of a woman? Are you going to be corrected by a woman on a donkey in front of 400 armed men? Well, David was a remarkable man. He, he could understand the voice of the Lord and he knew that the Lord was speaking to him. And so in verse 32, then David said to Abigail, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. 
And blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her what she had brought him and said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice. I have respected your person. David recognized God was correcting him through Abigail. Correction, sadly, is a mostly lost ministry in the church. It's lost because so few people want to receive godly correction. It's too bad because being corrected is a mark of true humility, of true servanthood. The Lord is coming. His coming compels us to identify with sinners in the sense that we are not that far removed from being lost ourselves. We need to tell them the truth that they are fools to say no to God when he is not willing that they should perish, but he is offering them eternal life. Those who are already following the Lord, they need to be encouraged to be strengthened for the journey while we wait. If they fail or fall, then we ought to correct them gently but firmly. And if it's us, we ought to receive that correction. Now we see the end of this episode We saw last time we were together in verses 36 through 38 that when Nabal awoke from his drunken stupor and heard how he had almost been killed, he had a stroke and then he died within about 10 days. And so we pick it up in verse 39. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. We are not to take personal vengeance upon another person. Uh, Hollywood aside, all the really great movies are about revenge, aren't they? Right at the beginning, somebody really evil does something really bad, and then the whole movie is about you killing that guy, and then he never dies early or easy. He has to die two or three times and almost kill you again at the end until you finally do something completely heinous to him and he's crushed and his blood and guts are spilling all over the place. And we, oh yeah, because it appeals to that sense enough that, that there needs to be a vendetta, there needs to be vengeance, we need to be vigilantes. And so David says, uh, I just left that to the Lord. Now, on the other end of the pendulum, people say, well, you have to leave all that to the Lord, and so we can't really punish people. God will sort all that out. No, that's not true. While we are not to exercise personal vengeance, God says, I've put that in the hands of the state where impartial individuals, judges and juries, look at a situation and say, yeah, you deserve judgment. And we've gone through the regular channels of law and you're going to be judged. You're going to be incarcerated. You're going to be killed. And so the state does have the right and the responsibility to carry out these things. And then ultimately the Lord is coming back and he'll sort everything out. So that's what it means that we're not to take vengeance. Vengeance is the Lord's. He will take care of it. Right now he takes care of it through uh, valid government. Uh, In the future he'll take care of it in a different way. Verse 39, uh, we read that, uh, so let me put the button here. Verse 40, when the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask for you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth and said, here is your maid servant, servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey, tended by five of her maidens. She followed the messengers of David and became his wife. Too bad it couldn't end there because then it says David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel. And so both of them were his wives. Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galim. And so there's a little bit of bookkeeping there, record keeping going on, but kind of a sad footnote. Uh, It's interesting to me, there seems to be a renewed interest in polygamy. There's a fictional cable TV show dedicated to it. And uh, there's another reality show that's getting ready to air that's going to follow the exploits of a polygamous uh, thing that's going on. Now, God tolerated polygamy in the Old Testament, but we see his intention for marriage in the Garden of Eden was one man and one woman for life. The Genesis account, verified by Jesus in the New Testament, commands a man to leave father and mother and to become one flesh with his wife 
not with his wives. In Deuteronomy 17, God commanded kings to not multiply wives to themselves. Of course, David did, and it caused him problems. Solomon did, and it caused him problems. Uh, And so uh, God said, look, don't do it. He tolerated it, but it wasn't his will. Then in the New Testament, qualification for spiritual leadership, and we would say for just spiritual maturity in men, is that they be the husband of one wife. Uh, And so while there's debate over, you know, whether that means a leader could have ever been divorced in the past and people go back and forth, it means that at any one time you should have one wife if you want to be a leader or a mature person in God's church. And then in Ephesians 5, the famous passage on marriage, uh, it refers to husband and wife in singular terms. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church, not your wives, however many you might gather to yourself. And so a pretty strong case can be made that polygamy uh, is not God's will and we would say that it's sin. Now David, the future king, took Abigail to be his bride. Jesus, the future king of kings, he's your bridegroom. When he returns to resurrect and rapture us, it will be as a bridegroom for his bride. Now one thing a bride does is make herself ready for her wedding day. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or, you know, frustrate anybody, but um, sometimes among Christians, especially not unique to Christians, but, uh, you know, you you go your whole life and and you, you know, you raise a daughter, let's say, and you, you know, you want to get to that place where she comes to the altar and you turn her over, you know, and all that great stuff. uh, And then you sit down with her prior to the, you know, she gets engaged and you sit down, you say, now, honey. Um, let's see how we can do this on $450. I, I think it's doable. I'll make my pesto. Uh, you know, got tomatoes growing in the yard. I'll make some pesto. Uh, the dollar store has wheat thins on sale. Uh, we'll have little wheat thin pesto, maybe a trisket or two, you know, for people who are wheat thin intolerant. Uh, and uh, mom's dress, I think, will fit you. Uh, you know, and I worked for me and, you know, and, and we'll do this and we'll cheap out and we'll do the cheapest possible wedding. I know they want you to rent Hidden Valley Park, but I think we can just get there early and, you know, say that we're using the gazebo and, and, uh, you know, sure it's Cinco de Mayo and there's be a lot of music. We'll just use that music, you know, and, so, and, and, you know, I, now it's an exaggeration, but not by much. I mean, I've been offended sometimes, you know, when people, I mean, it's just crazy. If that's all you can afford, that's great. But I think there's a general sense that we have that the wedding day is something really special and the, the bride wants to have made herself ready and be as beautiful as possible. Uh, And she's gone through the showers and the parties and all of that, making herself ready so that when that door opens at the back of the church and uh, or wherever she comes through the archway or whatever it might be, that everybody stands and turns around and their breath is taken away. And they think this is such a beautiful moment. People start crying and weeping and fainting and, you know, doing all kinds of other inappropriate things. But whatever it is, it's happening because the bride has made herself ready. And that's who we are as Christians. We are the bride. We are to make ourselves ready. And in the realm of making ourselves ready is an attitude towards servanthood. And it's up to us. I I love the Lord. He's so gentle and he's so kind. He looks at me and he says, Gene, what kind of servant do you want to be? I'll leave it to you. We We can deal on an employee relationship where you just, you know... Do things, you know, when when you feel like it. Uh, You can be an errand boy for me. If you happen to be going that way, maybe you'll do some work for me. But if not, uh, you know, I'll understand. And and we can choose all of those different things. But I think in our heart of hearts, and and I, I know, you know, this is true of anybody who is a Christian. I think in your heart of hearts, when you're alone with God, you think, I want to be able to be like Abigail because she was like Christ. I want to honestly say... I want to be a servant to other servants. Uh, not not in the, maybe the, the you know, actual sense, but in the heart sense that that's the kind of servant I see myself being. If there's a group of servants, I want to be the one who is the lowest servant, the one who's taking on the most menial task because that's what my Lord did for me. Jesus, uh, on the night 
he washed his disciples' feet. He waited and he waited and he waited for one of them to do something and then they never did. And then he stood up, it says, he took off his outer garment, he girded himself and he went foot by foot washing their feet and then he got up and he put his garments back on. And, and you know what? That whole thing was a picture of what he did spiritually for all all the human race. When he left heaven as God to become a man, the God-man, he divested himself of the outer robes, as it were, of his deity. And he came in the form of a man. And everything he did for 33 and a half years was to serve the human race on the lowest possible level. Born in a, in a manger, uh, living a ridiculously poor life in Nazareth, growing up to work with his hands living in relative obscurity for 30 years. No one knew anything about him except there's one incident when he's 12 years old and he's left behind at the temple. And then three and a half years of ministry where he was hated and despised by the religious leaders, culminating in a combination of Rome and the religious leaders, falsely accusing him and falsely trying him several times, plucking out his beard, opening his back with a Roman whip, crucifying him. And then Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he put those garments back on. He said, I've washed the feet of the human race. And that's the kind of servant he was. And that's the kind of servant we want to be in our best moments. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these things. I know that all of my brothers and sisters want to be more like you. It's, it's not even something we have to decide. It's, it's part of our fabric. It's, our, it's our, our spiritual DNA. If we've wandered in any sense, Lord, from that, if we have been thinking that serving you is something more voluntary or, or something part-time or something convenient, well, Lord, we're just wrong and we want to get back to serving you full-time. We want to be like Isaiah, Lord, who said, Here am I, Lord, send me. I want to be the one to go. I want to be the one to serve, whatever it is, because we know that you will strengthen us and empower us for it. And you'll do great and marvelous things for your name's sake. Fill us with a sense of wonder and awe, Lord, at your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand together.